We are about to hear Cormac McCarthy talk about quantum mechanics. And after we hear from McCarthy, I'm going to be pulling quotes from Stella Maris and The Passenger about quantum mechanics. And we're going to be configuring McCarthy's rhetoric and his prose into hopefully one solid theory and idea. And if you guys don't know, Right Conscious is the HQ of everything Cormac McCarthy. I have Cormac McCarthy t-shirts, a Cormac McCarthy course with over 15 hours of content and growing every single day. And let's now hear from Cormac. Well, Heisen, Heisen, back to Heisen, yeah. Yeah. Pally, the yeah. chest about. Yeah. Um, Pally really knew physics, and, right. and Heisenberg uh, didn't, not compared to what right. how Pally understood. But back then, you, you people would write letters five and six times a day, and then, you know, mail was delivered, you know, half a dozen times a day in some places, and it was sort of like email. <clears throat> and he, uh, and they would always be going to conferences, you know. And they'd be on a train going here, and the other one would be on a train going there, and they would write letters back and forth. And in one of, in one of Pauli's letters, he said, he writing to Heisenberg, he said, he said, I'm just astonished at, you know, your attitude towards these difficult problems. He said, I can only attribute it to your almost complete lack of understanding of physics, right. which, <laughs> which wasn't too far off. Right, but. But what Heisenberg had was this, just this understanding of how things should work. He had what he had what uh, what Einstein had. He just had a feeling for how things should work. And yet, and yet, there were these famous allegiances between Einstein and Schrödinger, who were much more mechanically oriented, whereas Heimber Heisenberg and others, and even you know Born, who felt that we didn't have to rely on the crutch of mechanism. Heisenberg didn't seem interested in having to explain quantum mechanics in terms of classical interactions. He said, give that shit up. And so there is, even though you say he had this deep feeling, it was a very deep feeling that no one else had. But he yeah. was new. Yeah, but, yeah. but still. Mm -hmm. it's, but still, quantum, quantum mechanics is, n is not that mysterious. It, it, it explains the quantum world. It's, it's, never, it's never been given a question it couldn't answer. Yeah. You know, which it's the most successful physical theory ever devised. Yeah, but a physical theory that is at odds with our intuition, which is largely classical. Yeah, it's it's right. it, it is at odds with mm. the classical understanding. Yeah, but yeah. then, but that's interesting. Again, talking about uh, Wittgenstein in respect to Russell. Okay. And then you know Heisenberg in respect to his superiors. You like these kind of young uh, mavericks who are overturning received yeah. wisdom. You're, you're drawn to that kind of character, to a kind of, um, I don't know if that's iconoclasm or if it's just a, a super intelligent disregard for the status quo. Well, I think what happens to physicists, uh, among other things, is that if, if, if you have some success when you're young, several things happen. One, one of them is that if, if, you, if, if you figure out a really difficult problem in physics when you're 21 years old, you're going to carry that with you for the rest of your life. And you're mm -hmm. going to think that that's how you do physics. But that's not how you do physics. That's how you do that problem in physics. Mm -hmm. And the other problem is that is if, if you're really successful, you build this world view that uh, that everything has to fit. Yeah. Whereas a, a somebody who has not had this success and having people, you know, pat you on the back, but they don't they don't care. You right. know, you you're more like Heisenberg. You, anything's possible. Right. So you're not fenced in by your accomplishments. By your own success. Yeah. So Alicia in Stella Mars describes quantum mechanics in this way. Quote. Yes, it's the most successful physical theory ever devised. It's the theory of small particles, atoms and smaller, or so it is commonly thought. But that may just be bad math. Some physicists suspect that the theory must eventually arrive at the understanding that the universe itself is a quantum phenomenon. That what, that what quantum mechanics ultimately describes is the universe. And so McCarthy here is setting up us to discuss the bridge between quantum mechanics and consciousness, which is 
probably the most popular aspect of quantum mechanics and what people discuss. And it's obviously very revelatory because when you look at Eastern mysticism, the occult and whatnot, it has very similar parallels. And you also don't need to have any mathematics or scientific knowledge to really dabble in those ideas or to think about them. So thus, that's why it is kind of at the forefront of pop physics, pop science type of ideas, presentations, and whatnot. And before we kind of move on, I just want to say that McCarthy actually is an advocate for pop physics and pop science. The other day, someone called my description of Will Durant as being a great writer as him being he's a pop historian. But in my reality, I would much rather understand and go deeper into things like nature, consciousness, yoga, things that are known to fill the inward cup rather than focusing on meta science and meta history. And I know some of you guys may differ in that opinion, but McCarthy, as stated, is a supporter of a lot of pop science and pop history and even pop literature books. So now let's transition to a big quote that comes after this that really gets into McCarthy's thoughts on the connection between quantum mechanics and consciousness. Quote, experiments, jet and kin or actual, seem to require our active involvement. If we are not there, they don't work. The ugly truth is that other than Feynman's sum over theories, there is no believable explanation of quantum mechanics that does not involve human consciousness. Of course, this raises the question as to how it managed to get along without us before we were invented. But it's not that simple. I think what is being pointed out is that human consciousness and reality are not the same thing, which we've known for a long time, even if we're not all that sure about Kant. In this instance, anyway, you can't ignore the evidence of the experiments. Everything from the two slits to all those strange doings with stern Gerlach magnets in which fairly bright scientists find themselves unable to outwit a sodium particle, it's a popular notion in some quarters that these inquiries are just philosophy, and the popular answer to them is just shut up and calculate. And the physicist says to Alicia, that's not you, and she says, no. All these calculations produce partial differential par partial differential equations. The truth of the universe is on the other side of those equations. The therapist says to Alicia, what do the physicists say about this? Alicia again, not much. Mostly, they roll their eyes. They're not Kantian sort of guys. The problem with the unknowable absolute is that if you could actually say something about it, it wouldn't be the unknowable absolute anymore. You can get from the noumenal to the phenomenal without stirring from your chair. In other words, nothing can be excerpted from the absolute without being rendered perceptual. Bearing in mind that to claim reality for what is unknowable is already to speak in tongues. The trouble with the perfect and objective world, Kant's or anybody's, is that it is unknowable by definition. I love physics, but I don't confuse it with absolute reality. It is our reality. Mathematical ideas have a considerable shelf life. Do they exist in the absolute? How is that possible? I said to myself. But then myself became another self, no more than right. It took the math with it, the idea, a long period of uncertainty. When I re-cohered, I was someplace else, as if I had escaped my own light cone into what I used to be called the absolute elsewhere. The therapist says, I don't understand. Alicia responds, I know, me either. It's just that my view was that you can't fetch something out of the absolute without fetching it out of the absolute, without converting it into the phenomenological, by which it then becomes our property with our fingerprints all over it, and the absolute is nowhere to be found. Now, I'm not so sure. Okay, there is a lot to go over here, and it kind of starts to blend in with the kid a little bit. So, McCarthy postulates that you can't take something from the absolute because once it comes back to reality, and this happens in shamanic and psychedelic experiences, for instance, you go get some magical piece of information, but then when it comes back or the change you've undergone is, is back in reality, it's, it's automatically bombarded by subjective reality, the phenomenological, and it's no longer the absolute. And this kind of goes back to one of McCarthy's axiomatic philosophies that math doesn't exist without us present. Because how can something as abstract as mathematics exist in the absolute or transcendent self outside of humans? And this all ties back to what we read at the start of the passage in that we can discuss this absolute reality all we want in videos like this or in philosophical inquiries, but it's just a description of the absolute. It actually isn't the absolute. The Tao that is called the Tao is not the Tao. And now through science, we have run into the same exact problem that Lao Tzu and others figured out over 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago. 
And this is, you know, Kant was very big in this because Kant was inspired by Spinoza, and they all kind of have that Eastern, you know, incel insular type of attitude. I mean, there was a reason why both Kant and Spinoza were very much homebodies and spent most of their life just philosophizing and like deep in study without too many distractions. Because when you kind of have that attitude, you're not like Francis Bacon, who's out hunting. You're not Voltaire, who's advising kings or Nietzsche going on mental trips. Hegel, the, the greatest professor in Germany. You're not those guys. Suddenly, you're a lesser than. And through that, you know, marginalization, they were, you know, the first to really question on, you know, in the philosophical wars, the limit to human knowledge. And so I want to ask you guys now, what do you what do you think Alicia is talking about the, at the end? Why is she bringing it up? Because I think she's actually talking about the kid. I think she went into a wormhole and she's dragged out the kid who is a part of the absolute. Is I, I think in the story we are meant to view them as these corp, corporeal, corporeal, corporal beings. We have the kid appearing on the beach with Bobby. We have the kid very present in Alicia's life. They may be, uh, the kid may be, well, I think he is a descendant of Blood Meridian's kid. And we can get into all the quantum theories and all that relating to him at a later time. But Alicia feels like she has a part of the absolute with the kid. And he's, un other than, you know, maybe some of his physical deformities, he is of the absolute at a much higher level than just being like a trace element, kind of how, kind of how we are. And even though it may seem weird, this kind of hierarchical deity stuff isn't necessarily rare to McCarthy. And the outer dark we have in outer dark we have the triune and uh, the orchard keeper and Setri. we have a lot of shamanic witch stuff going on obviously in blood meridian we have kind of a gnostic novel with the judge seemingly on a different rung of the hierarchy so throwing the kid into the absolute really isn't that wacky in terms of like mccarthyanisms so what do you guys think? I know once again that I'm not a very big nerd and I always get these like multi-paragraph comments telling me that I'm wrong about everything when it comes to quantum physics, but luckily we didn't go too deep into quantum physics. We just kind of I'm just kind of riffing on the stuff that I do know related to Kant and the absolute and the, the kid and whatnot. But let me know your thoughts. What did I miss? What did I glance glance over in terms of a quantum interpretation of Stella Maris and the passenger? And I will see you guys in the next video.